Good afternoon. Hello, colleagues. I'm Dan Epstein from the Pan American Health Organization Communications Unit, and I want to welcome you to this session of Ask the Experts on nine months of the new coronavirus, what we know and what remains to be seen. We have two distinguished participants with us, Dr. Marcos Espinal, who's the director of the Department of Communicable Diseases, and Environmental Determinants of Health at the Pan American Health Organization, and Dr. Anselm Hennis, who is Director of the Department of Non-Communicable Diseases and Mental Health at the Pan American Health Organization. So we want to start by noting that this week we reached nine months since the very first case of the novel coronavirus was reported in Wuhan, China in December 2019, at the very end of December. Uh, in the past nine months, this virus has rampaged through the world, really. It has infected more than 33 million people, and unfortunately, more than 1 million people have died. In the region of the Americas itself, we have had 16.7 million cases, and we've had 550,000 deaths. But are numbers still going up in the region? Is it time to think about reopening what can we learn from Europe? Are vulnerable groups still the same? What is PAHO doing to address COVID-19 in the region? To answer these and other questions, we're joined by the two experts from the Pan American Health Organization, Dr. Marcos Espinal and Dr. Anselm Hennis. And we'll be talking about the main issues around COVID-19 and answering your questions. So please, you're welcome to write to us in the comments section of this live session which is being broadcast on Facebook Live and on Twitter, on the PAHO social media channels. And we'll get to you and try to answer your questions throughout the course of the chat. But let's start with Dr. Espinal to give us kind of an overview. Dr. Espinal, we're still having a very high number of cases, but some countries or many countries in our region have started to lift the public health measures that they had imposed previously and are allowing people to go back to work, to go back to school, etc. Is this the right thing to do at this time? Are we over the worst of it and can we have confidence now? Or what? how would you assess the situation, Dr. Espinata? Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think the situation, uh, it's very dynamic and uh, we are not yet out of the problem. Um, um, several countries are experiencing in the region, are experiencing now declines of uh, COVID. In other words, they, they are uh, suggesting that they are flattening the curve. Others are not yet. Um, however, the fact that the, a country shows um, decreasing trends doesn't mean that the country is out of the problem because we have seen already second wave of COVID in Europe, in several European countries. Today we are seeing that new measures are implemented in, in European countries. So, so um, since we don't have yet cure for COVID or vaccines for COVID, um, we still um, need to continue implementing um, the non-pharmaceutical measures that we know, like hand washing constantly, face mask use, and uh, distance, social distance. This has proven it's working. Um, because um, um, uh, we still don't know all the answers about this virus. It's nine months, as you said. It looks like it was yesterday. And, and we understand there is fatigue and countries are reopening, but we need to be resilient and innovative to ensure that we continue with these actions recommended by PAHO and by WHO. Um, because we're not gonna get away, I, out of this soon. I mean, the vaccine is not closed yet. And even if tomorrow is announced a potential vaccine, it will take time 
to implement, because remember, the world is about 8 billion people. So we cannot vaccinate uh, 8 billion people in one day. The region of the Americas has half of the cases, basically, and almost half of the death. And several countries in the Americas still are showing uh, substantial numbers of, of COVID. So I'm um, patient and, um, and, being, uh, and listening to the recommendations is very important. And if countries are decided to reopen, and we can talk about that, they should do it following some recommendations that um, we have been promoting and, uh, and we can talk about it in, 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 during the hour. All right. Um, let's ask Dr. Hennis. Uh, we learned early on in the pandemic, Dr. Hennis, that the people most at risk of severe COVID-19 were older adults and people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, non-communicable diseases. Is this pretty much still the case? What do we have as recommendations for people with these pre-existing conditions and for the communities where these conditions like diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, et cetera, are more prevalent? Yes, thank you. And indeed a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, you, Marcos. Well, as you said, really, it's been a learning experience for us all. Um, as we know, the non-communicable diseases are diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, chronic respiratory diseases. These are the big four non-communicable diseases. And of course, there are others, conditions like obesity, hypertension, among others. And in fact, we didn't learn early on. It was been um, an incremental learning experience. In fact, this is actually probably the very first time that we have seen an epidemic or pandemic linked and driven so closely um, by non-communicable diseases. They've been examples in the past, for example, where there have been big flu outbreaks, we have seen links with um, hypertension as well as obesity. Never have we seen this scale of interplay between communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases. So it's been a learning experience for all of us. Mm -hmm. and, um, the reality is, as you said quite clearly, people with online conditions that I just mentioned, as well as older people, are more at risk of having severe COVID or from dying of COVID. And um, so therefore, um, having, having learned and having established what those who are most at risk, the approach really comes down to slowing the spread, saving lives, um, the core issues of how we deal with this pandemic. And those who are more vulnerable, as you've pointed out so clearly, are those who have to continue the non-pharmaceutical interventions, which my colleague, Dr. Marcos, has been, I just pointed out in terms of uh, and washing, social distancing, wearing masks, respiratory hygiene. In addition to which, they also have to look after themselves, have to take their medications. And that has been a challenge which we get into a little bit more as we continue the discussion. And then recognizing those who are most vulnerable. And in fact, this has really been quite a learning experience at many levels. Because with the whole issue of social distancing, what we have seen in many settings is those who are on the front line, the front line workers who can't work remotely, who have to go to work, are those who are also more at risk of having things like hypertension and diabetes and obesity and all these interrelated conditions. And it's also been linked, for example, to people's um, ethnic group. So we're seeing greater outbreaks among people, for example, who may be considered ethnic minorities or the larger countries, people of African descent, people of um, indigenous Indian descent, et cetera, people of Hispanic descent in North America, they have carried a disproportionate burden of disease because they're both frontline workers and they have higher proportions and prevalences of these online non-communicable diseases. So it really has been a, an exercise in terms of looking at um, the whole social protection net, trying to ensure that vulnerable people are identified and trying to be sure that they understand the health promotion issues as well as have access to appropriate protection. So it's been a very, very complex um, learning experience for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a question for, for both of you, really. Maybe Dr. Hennis, if you can continue and then Marcos can chime in. Uh, COVID-19 obviously is not the only major public health issue that's impacting our region. So how can we manage 
infectious diseases, what recommendations do we have to manage diseases such as dengue, such as malaria, such as HIV, as well as the diseases that you had been talking about, like cancer and heart disease? How has COVID-19 really impacted the health system's uh, management of these diseases? And what can we do to improve that situation? Yes, well, I think it's a very, very important question. And I'm sure Marcus and I will, will bring our particular perspectives and lenses to that particular issue. But certainly in many regards, it's actually exposed, for example, existing gaps in provision of care and first and first line of care in the health systems at the primary health care level. So for example, non-communicable diseases, we have seen that services to manage hypertension, diabetes related complications in the region of the Americas have actually been disrupted in as many as 50% of settings. So the actual service is no longer available because in many instances, um, they are close to meet the COVID response with people being sent to the front line for COVID. And so the service is closed. On the other hand, for example, um, patients didn't seek care because of the needs for social distancing, the lack of transportation, and even fear of going for care. So it really was a tremendous disruption of essential care. And uh, in some regards, there were um, um, situations that adapted, because what we really need to have is a resilient and an agile health system. Um, resilient in that it can continue to manage the needs of the community and agile to adapt to the increased demands of COVID. So, um, so there are many lessons of learning. There was a, um, there, for example, um, clinic sizes had to be had to be changed when they were operational because you couldn't have large numbers of people gathering in a setting. So the whole issue of triaging became important and directing mm -hmm. patients where they can receive care. Issues, for example, access to medications. So in other words, the, there are new ways of having people have medications for a three month period rather than on a monthly basis. And even, for example, collection points within the community so that disruption services didn't take place. And of course, accessing healthcare by being able to contact the services and the doctors so there could be some continuity of care. But it really um, opened up to much learning. And of course, the whole issue of telemedicine, where it was available, became another issue. And I, I will hand over to my colleague, Dr. Marcus, at this time too. So let, him, let him share some of his ideas as well. Okay. Thank you, Ansel. Um, you know, the Ameri this is a very good question because, good question because we, we don't want to send a wrong message that the only health problem is COVID. Right. We have plenty of health problems in the Americas. And, and let me put it in a positive way. This region has been a trail, trailblazer in eliminating infectious diseases. In fact, the Pan-American Health Organization, which is the oldest public health agency in the world, created in 1902, was created because of the threats of infectious diseases when the Canama, Canama, uh, Panama Canal was uh, being built. Yellow fever, malaria. Mm -hmm. And the region has gone very far in eliminating many preventable vaccine preventable diseases like polio, like uh, smallpox, congenital rubella, but also others are on the way for elimination like onchocerciasis or river blindness, lymphatic filariasis, and malaria is it's, it's, it's on its way also. But COVID has disturbed everything. And the problem with that is that we tend to focus in only one, and that should not be the case. The message to our governments and member states is be innovative in focus, focusing both in COVID, but also in, pro in protecting the gains of reducing infectious diseases and keeping the services for the population. Because the easy way to uh, lose our gains is not to take attention, is to, to take our attention away from those. Uh, there is a famous um, curve in public health, it's called the U shape of concern. And I do this 
when a disease is going down, going down, and it goes to a minimum level, some governments tend to say, well, no more cases. Let's focus in those who has high incidence. But what happened is, if we don't finish the job of eliminating some of these diseases, the curve that was going down is going to go like this. And will go up again. It's called the U-shaped curve of concern in public health. So, and that is the reason it's easy. You know, if we remember malaria was going down in Latin America, but, you know, due to a, sit a political situation in a country of the region and also to COVID, we have been seeing increases in malaria in several of our countries. And let me just complete this by saying, it's only human beings. It's not COVID versus the other one. So strengthen the programs, keep the health services strong, ensure supply of commodities, medicines, tests, vaccines for other diseases. And PAHO can help with that, as it has been helping for decades through its technical cooperation services, through its strategic fund for commodities and medicines, and through its um, revolving fund for vaccines, so, which no other region has, this, this amazing tool. So it is important we pay attention to NCDs and to communicable diseases because our region has an epidemiological profile that is dual. We have a lot of high burden of NCDs. Infectious diseases are going down in some cases, but the, the work is not yet done. And we still have a long way to go in terms of HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, neglected tropical diseases. Mm -hmm. so, and protect the gains. When we look at immunization programs that are being stopped or paused in some cases because of COVID, this is a major risk because who's going to suffer? Our children, the future generation. If I, Dan, if I may just come back in here again, Please. because Mark's made a lot of very important points. And I see a question in the chat box about how bad is regions of the Americas in terms of things like diabetes and heart disease prior to the pandemic. So I think really just to set the context, non-communicable diseases uh, really are the major cause of ill health and death in the region. And in fact, 81% of total deaths in the Americas, and that's about 5.5 million deaths a year out of 6.9 million deaths total, 81% are due to non-communicable diseases. And in fact, of these 5.5 million, 2.2 million deaths occur between ages of 30 to 70, the so-called premature deaths due to non-communicable diseases. So it really is a huge health challenge in the region of the Americas. And, and um, the drivers are things like um, cigarette smoking, harmful use of alcohol, physical inactivity, and poor diets. And as you can imagine, during a time like COVID, many of these situations are actually exacerbated. So, um, and, and a question asked too, in other words, will these things like diabetes and heart disease become worse? And the reality is this, we're getting information, it's patchy, but the reality is this, we, we, we're having um, decreased deaths than expected reported. But what we're seeing is that the actual overall mortality is increasing over and beyond what is expected just for COVID. I respect as the data become um, more granular, we get more information, we're going to be rec recording these deaths due to these non-communicable diseases that were actually missed because people couldn't seek care and get appropriate care. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, data from the UK suggests that certain types of cancer might increase as much by, as much by about 10% because people can get appropriate cancer care. But these, as I said before, it's a learning process. You're getting more information and data but certainly if you have not had ideal dialysis or cancer care or care for your diabetes and complications, we expect more problems, and this is pre-existing conditions. And I guess the other side of the coin too, is that COVID damages the cardiovascular system and the lungs, mm -hmm. and as well as the vascular system to the brain. So then there's a whole new question about what will happen to non-communicable diseases longer term as a direct consequence of COVID. 
And so there's so many questions not enough answers. But I, I fully support what my colleague Marcos has been saying in terms of the, the, the need to strengthen the systems because they've got to cope with what exists and the additional challenges that we will face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, I know that we, Dr. Espinal, the Latin America and the Caribbean was one of the last regions uh, to experience community transmission and cases of COVID-19. Can we learn anything from the experiences of other regions like Europe uh, and some of the Southeast Asian countries, which are now experiencing a continuation of the first wave or a second wave? Are there lessons for us from those countries? What would they be, Dr. Espinal? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dan. That's a very good point uh, because the most important lesson is let not put our guards down. Let not get away thinking that this is over. And there is a famous phrase in baseball called it's not over, it's not over until it's over. So um, um, what we are seeing in Europe now means for this region that countries that are probably seeing a decline in cases, if they don't continue the actions recommended, uh, they will see second wave and, and, and more COVID. Mm -hmm. And this region has been the most affected basically. So a um, um, couple of messages. If a country decide to reopen because the situation is improving and because we understand that the economy needs to be reopening because Latin America and the Caribbean has a high informal economy, is the highest in terms of, of the highest uh, region in terms of inequities of the, uh, in the world. Uh, several population groups living in situation of vulnerability, huge cities, highly urbanized, you know, like Rio, like Mexico City, uh, Bogota, surrounded by belts of poverty, where it's more difficult to do social distance uh, and, 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 and lack of access, uh, uh, water and sanitation in many cases. So there's a combination of factors and meaning that if the situation is improving and they decide to reopen, make sure the public health actions are still there. The economic and financial people needs to sit down with the public health people because, and we understand the fatigue, but if we keep a couple of actions in place, we might be able to prevent new outbreaks or increasing cases. I'm not saying 100% because as I said, we still don't know all the, this is, this is a very nasty virus. But for instance, making sure testing is massively available to the population. It's one key issue to detect incipient outbreaks. And immediately we detect someone positive, do the trace or tracking of the contact of these positive cases. Because what would avoid a new outbreak would be isolating these contacts immediately. I mean, countries can do, for instance, limited quarantines, you know, or cordon sanitaire uh, in communities and so on. So it is vital to have a tracking system, massive testing available, tracking system of contacts to avoid a second wave and the non-pharmaceutical measures. Mm -hmm. and, and people sometimes criticize because, you know, we don't want to use face mask and so on, but I, I counter challenge that saying in Asia, the use of masks, it's been for ages. They use masks very normally. Why we can't, the human being, it's able to adapt to anything. We live in a resilient world and there is no doubt in my view we can do it. So, so keeping those non-pharmaceutical measures and finally, and as important, 
education information program to the population. So testing, rules, and discipline. So we are innovative to, so the people can still follow the rules. Otherwise, we're gonna see second wave of COVID like Europe is, is seen and some countries in, in Asia. Because uh, until we have the vaccine and a vaccine that is, or vaccines that are very well placed in the immunization programs of our country, our countries, uh, it's gonna take time. It's gonna take time to get out of this. So we need, we need to learn how to live with this normalcy. Right. Um, very good. Dr. Hennis, we have a question from Linda Williams who is asking specifically about the Caribbean. How do we safely manage travel and tourism in the tourism dependent Caribbean countries uh, that are now in some cases opening up to uh, travelers and tourists. Uh, what, what are the best ways to approach that? Right. Well, again, it, as I, as again, it's an iterative process where one is learning lessons, and the principles that Marcos pointed out, Dr. Espinal pointed out, are really the key issues in terms of the non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, but then, of course, when you're opening your economy, you're bringing people in from outside who may not be subject to the same situation that you managed to achieve in your country. Now, there's some Caribbean countries that have done remarkably well. Some colleagues at the University of West Indies and Broadway has published a paper recently in terms of the, the um, regulations that limited um, population mobility and the curfews. And they're able to show, for example, that um, when the, the regulations came into place in some of the countries initially, the actual mobility dropped very significantly and they used it by using Google Track. So the now the people out about fell because the, there were significant fines to enforce the curfew. And then with the imposition of regulations and the population that was responsive because of the regulations, um, they, they never moved from, um, they never moved to full-blown community spread. Um, and I think again, there, there's, there's there are lessons in all of this. But the point is this, you cannot have um, a situation whereby your economy remains closed and health and economy cannot exist as a dichotomy. They have to coexist, but it has to coexist in a context that puts public health first. So many lessons that um, Marco spoke about are still relevant here. So if you're gonna let people come into your country, as far as you can achieve it, you have to be sure that the people coming to your country are not bringing the infection. So you can establish guidelines, national guidelines, national policies, even some regional policies about um, the evidence for those who are traveling in terms of not traveling with known COVID cases. And then some countries have policies in place where people land. They then are tested, they have gone to go rapid test. Those who are positive are then isolated, taken out of the community. Those who may be exposed might also be um, monitored because they are potentially um, contacts of those who were exposed. And then of course, um, um, then, of course, so tracking and tracing those who came and who might have been exposed into the country. And, of course, making the services available to those who've come to the country who could potentially become ill while there. So um, and, and I know, for example, in North America, um, some friends traveled there recently again. There are apps when you get into Canada, for example, and they can guarantee that you remain in isolation when you reach the country for the period of two weeks. So there are digital innovations to ensure that you actually are isolated for the prescribed period of time when you enter the country. If you then remain well, you can then move into the community. If you become ill during that time period, you have to seek help. So there are other digital and electronic apps that can help to support the need for um, quarantine when you go across borders even if you arrive and your test is negative. So negative tests when you arrive, measures for quarantine in the country, um, even apps where possible to help track movement. And then once everything is clear, you remain well, then you can integrate within the community. And I think these are pragmatic ways of dealing with it. Marcos, perhaps you might wish to add something to this. Uh, let me just interject a little bit there because, uh, you know, the issue of the Caribbean is, 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 is tricky because the question is important. It's, it's just, main industry is tourism. Uh, but there are recommendations for if the country decides to reopen, 
for their recommendations regarding how to manage resorts, you know, um, sanitation constantly, the use of social distance within the resorts, um, and, and, and testing availability also. Um, you know, people who go to the resorts, they wanted to be in their resorts and the beach and something like that. So, so sometimes, you know, you can limit the travel outside the resorts and, and have completely system of, of uh, you know, to monitor and to test and, and identify anyone with, with, with symptoms and signs. In addition to what uh, Ansel just said about landing and, and availability of testing and so on. Because, I mean, um, it will be unfair to tell countries not to reopen at some point um, because, I mean, they said, you, you don't die of COVID, but might die of hunger or, 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 lack of, or lack of money to provide for the family and the children. So that is very important. I think the key issue is also for the countries to consult PAHO. PAHO has offices in most of the countries of the region, including the Caribbean. We have offices in Barbados, we have offices in Trinidad and Tobago, in Bahamas, and we have outstanding expertise in these offices that are at the service of the, of the people and the countries. It's not only we're in Washington, but the, the beauty of our organization is we have offices in many of these countries, an international expert base in those countries. So, so uh, we are at the service of the countries and we are ready to accompany uh, um, the ministries of health, the authorities, and, and we have outstanding people. So, so the public can consult the websites of PAHO where all the recommendations are, and the government knows they can consult our offices. They do all the time. And we, 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 we're ready to serve and to accompany them in mitigating the impact of COVID not only in their people, but also in the industry. And, 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 and I must say, this is also a society, all society responsibility, industry, private sector, civil society, communities, engaging community, engaging community leaders is vital. Um, so it's all government, but also the people and the different levels of society in every country of the Caribbean, and in South America and in Central America. Dan? Yeah, that's very good, Marcos, thank you. Uh, and now going from the government side of things to the people side of things, I wanted to ask Dr. Hennis, what, I know that people are suffering from the effects of COVID-19, from being locked down, uh, maybe physically, maybe loss of work, loss of income, but are they also suffering from mental health problems? Uh, what, are, what do we know about what the impact on mental health is of these non-pharmaceutical measures? And what can we recommend to ensure that people stay healthy uh, in this respect in the medium term and in the long term? Do we have some uh, guidance on that, Dr. Hennis? Yes, you've asked a very, very important question. <clears throat> And I think, uh, just to set a context again, I think people don't recognize the tremendous burden and impact of uh, mental health issues in our region. Normally as many as a third of um, the disability in the Americas is due to not mental health and substance use problems. And in fact, um, we know that depression is the major cause of disability in the Americas and anxiety ranks at out number three. And this is quite often a bit of a silent epidemic. People are just not aware. And then we know that um, during um, emergency situations, such as we see with COVID, as many as one in every five persons gets a mental health condition in a situation of acute emergency or acute crisis. COVID has been particularly challenging for populations because COVID is linked to things like social isolation, unemployment, joblessness, and, you, and you, Marcus talked about it too, joblessness, um, food and housing insecurity. You're having cycles of bad news. You're having false news, okay? People are locked in their homes. Children can't go to school. You cannot go to places of worship. Humans cannot congregate. Humans are social beings. So you're having this crisis compounded by 
all the other externalities that you cannot control. So, and, and not just that, the period of time of COVID really has not, is not in the foreseeable near future. So the suffering is immense. Young people now, you know, adolescents and young adults who tend to be out socializing, etc., are confined to homes. And it's all very, very difficult. So what we know in terms of the information that we have from about four countries, Brazil, Mexico, the United States, and Canada, is that as many as half of people who are surveyed are suffering mental health challenges and depression and anxiety and concerns because of COVID and the COVID infodemic, so-called infodemic, all this excess um, news that's going on about the epidemic. So it really is affecting people's sleep, depression, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, people being cooped up in the house together for long periods of time leads to things like increase interpersonal violence and so forth. So at many, many levels, we're just seeing um, a multiplication of, of, of bad things happening in social networks. We talk about physical distancing, but we don't call it physical distancing. We call it social distancing. And human beings are social creatures. So, yeah, so there's so many issues which have really made the mental health situation really extremely challenging at a level I've never seen before. Now, what do you do about it? I think what, the first thing you have to do is to take care of yourself at an individual level. Eating properly, eating healthy meals, sleeping well, turning off that news cycle, putting on all your little devices so you get sleep as much as you can, and um, exercising. I said earlier on that things like um, physical activity, eating well, not smoking, not drinking, are all part of the, of the cycle for better health. And many of these issues have gone off kilter during the COVID epidemic. So do the right things for your well-being. For, and go for walks, of course. You know, adults are supposed to get about one, 50 minutes of walk, of walking per week or running per week for physical activity. For younger people, particularly children, it's important to give them structure. Quite often, you know, access to school is not necessarily universal. So giving children structure, um, giving them support, um, one has to listen, one has to engage. And, and there are various tools that have been produced by PAHO and WHO, which help to fill this gap um, in terms of information and guidance. Um, parents have to be more engaged and have to be more sympathetic. So there's just so many things that we can do in terms of our own self-care, self-awareness, engagement, building networks. Because you cannot necessarily see people physically, it doesn't mean you can't engage virtually. One of the very satisfying stories I heard from a colleague, um, a colleague now um, from Chile, was that since COVID, she's now connected with a cousin she never knew existed, and they do it virtually. I actually have some brilliant friends over in the UK, and we actually have Zoom calls just to reconnect and talk. And all of these issues have really brought a lot of pleasure and color to my own life at an individual level. So there are things we can do to make our, our lives better, in spite of the challenges of COVID. Okay. Yeah. And then, Marcos, let me ask you one last question, because we're getting to the end of our allotted time. And uh, we've had a couple of queries from the uh, public watching this who ask, uh, basically, how long should people quarantine when they arrive on flights from high-risk countries? Is 14 days still the accepted quarantine? And uh, a corollary question, what is, when is the recommended time for testing following potential exposure? Marcos? Yeah, I, I saw the question for, from Linda, yeah, um, in the chat. So, um, yeah, it's 14 days, the recommendation. Uh, um, uh, two weeks, basically, um, uh, to make sure that, uh, because, you know, most of the symptoms appears three to five days after exposure. And, and, and there are some people that are asymptomatic actually, uh, and they don't show symptoms. But, but some people can show symptoms of 10, 12 days after exposure. So, so it is important that, that, that uh, if, if you feel, uh, if a person feels that has been exposed, uh, in the start, I mean, um, having a test immediately if you don't have uh, any symptoms uh, might not be necessary. So, but uh, as long as, uh, because 
eighty percent of the cases are mild and moderate. But if 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 we suspect we were in contact with someone, and and start feeling a little bit uh, under the weather or so, uh, go and have a test if if the test is available. Um, of course, it depends also on the availability because. There is also the issue that in some countries where, you know, and we know there has been shortage of tests. So people don't want it to go and do a line because they are afraid of, 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 of getting infected in the line. So, so, but one thing you can do is to auto isolate yourself. If you don't have symptoms or if you think you are exposed and you don't want, if you, if you feel that there is no test or something like that, um, you can auto isolate yourself uh, if the test is available, you recommend it to do the test, you know, uh, when you feel under the weather and, and because if you are, you feel that you were in contact with someone. Um, but the most important thing is to be in quarantine for 14 days. Um, COVID-19 cured by itself. There is no medicine for COVID. The key issue is try to avoid spreading infections to your loved ones to isolate yourself in your home. If you live with someone, you try to, as much as possible, isolate in a room. The person who is getting you the food or things like that should also be using masks. The per and, and you should be also using masks, those who are exposed, if you feel you are infected. And it should go away. If serious symptoms like, you know, short of breath, high fevers and dehydration comes, that is time to go to the hospital and and, and 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 of course the idea is to go to your doctor as soon as you feel symptoms you know and the doctor will decide if the person should do quarantine at home or should be hospitalized um, uh, because he needs you know respiratory help and other medicines that help with the recovery of covid Right. Uh, I must add, there is no cure, but there, there are medicines that are recommended now that are helping to make to people recover faster for those with serious disease or, or, or severe disease in hospital. So, so um, and, and we have learned a lot after nine months, but still no vaccine, no cure for COVID. Right. Um, we're almost at the end, but I wanted to ask both of you to reiterate what are the basic pieces of advice you would give people, both in the Caribbean and in Latin America, to avoid exposure to COVID? Uh, can, can we talk specifically about indoors versus outdoors, social distancing and mask use, just in terms of practical advice, so people watching will know what to do? Marcos, maybe we start with you and finish with Dr. Hennis. Yeah, I think, uh, I think we need to be hopeful. We need to be positive. Uh, we will go through this. Uh, there's, there's no doubt in my view, you know, we have, uh, we had before um, H1N1, Zika, other pandemics, Ebola in Africa. Uh, but still we need to be patient and we need to be innovative. Um, we need to continue with the non-pharmaceutical measures, three face mask, they work, hand washing, social distance. Doing indoor gatherings is not recommended uh, unless it's a very small group and you know them and, and, and for sure they, you know, because it's a risk. The, the, the risk of getting infected in indoor gatherings is very high, uh, mainly in countries where winter is coming, uh, where people spend more time indoors. So outdoor gatherings in a small groups sometimes, yeah, could be done doing the, the social distance things. Um, but as Hennis was saying, you know, being innovative, use virtual means to get to know people and reconnect, Zooms and, and Teams and all these new virtual tools we have. Um, we need to, we, we cannot think we're going to go back to the, to the previous normalcy until we, we get to know fully this virus, 
until we get to get the, 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 the vaccines. And there will be a vaccine. There are more than 180 vaccines being tested. Not all of them will be in the market because not all of them will be efficacious. And, and, but there will be, for sure. Uh, there's no doubt. Um, not 100% I could say this, but uh, uh, I would say there is a high, high percentage that we will have a vaccine. One of those will be a good one, and hopefully it will be so. And PAHO is preparing to assist countries to make sure the vaccine is available. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, be resilient, be hopeful, implement the measures, be innovative, do a little bit of a jogging, do a little bit of read, uh, call family, um, try to keep your heads up uh, because we will get through this. Okay. That's a very, that's a very hopeful message. Um, and I'd like to ask Dr. Hennis if uh, there are specific things he would say to people living in our Caribbean islands along the same lines of what Marco said, are there specific things that Caribbean populations should be uh, watching out for, should be doing, should be avoiding, and what should they be doing to take care of themselves? Yeah, I think the Caribbean is a brilliant place for living now, generally in times of COVID. I mean, some countries are showing a spike, which is a bit dis distressing, and some countries are doing very, very well. But to I mean, there is sunshine, there are beaches, there are places to go walking and so forth. It is absolutely wonderful in the Caribbean and it's warm and sunny. So, you know, take advantage of what you have. Be optimistic. COVID won't be here with us all the time. We have a better tomorrow to look for. Take care of yourself. What Marco said in terms of the um, non-pharmaceutical interventions, you know, hand washing, social distancing and wearing masks is still very important. I think... I find it very distressing when I go on um, some of the social media or Facebook and I see people congregating and no one is wearing masks anymore. And it's like, guys, this epidemic is not going. Perhaps the numbers are coming on and, 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 and you're sort of um, flattening the curve. It is still with us. Take it seriously. And you know, I've had to talk to senior colleagues in some of the islands and say to them, you know, let the people remember that this pandemic is not going. You're doing very well but there could be a second wave or resurgence if you let your guard down, be sensible about it. And, and so, by, so reinforce and keep the, me the measures going that save lives and slow the spread of the epidemic, et cetera, do that. And then of course, um, look after yourself and connect socially with your loved ones. Um, and I think the other thing too is that we were recognizing we're into a new normal. I think the way the many things that we've seen as changes in the short term, will be with us longer in terms of, for example, in terms of how we might access care, the fact that we cannot congregate, et cetera, in the foreseeable future. Though, of course, it's, this is happening gradually as the, as the um, economy is open, but it's a process that's going to take time. So do the right things, be sensible, and let us, let's be mindful of the fact that we need to continue the measures that allow us to open our, our economies and protect our health and well-being. Who doesn't want to be in the most beautiful beaches in the world of in the country? <laughs> Use what you have, as Dr. Henry said. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Espinal and Dr. Hennis. This concludes our uh, Ask the Experts session from the Pan American Health Organization. We want to thank the audience for being with us, and we want to take to heart the advice that we got from these two experts who have given us some reason for hope and certainly some reason for continued caution in face of the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you very much and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>